frame flow in a single basic service area. What really, I mean, behind the scenes, after it's all said and done, what's really going on inside of that cell? Well, my friend, that's what this video is all about. Let's begin. I'd like you to imagine with me that you're sitting at your computer and you want to verify that you have basic reachability or connectivity to some other IP address. Now, if you're like me, one of the first tools that comes to mind is a really quick ping using ICMP to verify that connectivity. So how would that work? Well, on Ethernet, let's say this is a little Ethernet segment. So this is the PC that you and I are sitting at. This is the device we want to verify. Let's say it's a server or something else. We simply run ping. And now behind the scenes, if we haven't done the layer three, to layer two mapping, there might be some ARP that occurs, address resolution protocol. But after ARP happens, Effectively, we send one ICMP echo request, a ping request, and we get an ICMP echo reply that verifies that we have connectivity between us and that device. So presuming the ARP has already been done and we're doing a single ping, we have two packets and two frames involved in this ping. So we take a look at our title. This could be in binary, it's a little joke, a tale of two frames in binary, that's a two. Because that's exactly what would be involved in ethernet, again, presuming the ARP had already been taken care of. Now let's take that same scenario again, presuming the ARP has already been done. How many frames would it take for a device on a wireless basic service area like this one right here to go ahead and ping a second device over here? Because that's what I'd like to chat with you right now. Now this access point, I'm using a D-Link because I had it in a box. <laughs> so I plugged it in for this demonstration. And this D-Link is an access point and it's in infrastructure mode. That means this Apple device and this Alpha device, they do not really directly communicate with each other. They might be able to see each other's radio waves if they're within reach of each other, but if they want to ping each other, they don't just talk directly to each other. The signals are going to go back and forth between the access point and themselves. And this distribution system, which in this case is the access point, is going to be moving the data back and forth between those parties. So this is our scenario for this discussion. And we're gonna answer all of these questions in the process of looking at the communication of a single ping between a wireless device and a second wireless device in the same basic service area. I think you'll be shocked at how much traffic really has to go on to pull off a single one ping back and forth. And not to give too much away, we might wanna keep our eye on the number 10 in decimal. Because the packets do not lie, we're going to use a protocol analyzer, specifically Wireshark, to assist us in looking at all the conversation that's taking place. The first question I wanted to talk with you about is which devices are involved in this ping between the Apple and the Alpha device. And so we're going to use red here just for a moment. So there's an Apple. The Apple's also at this IP address, 187. That's the Apple. There's the Apple again. What Wireshark is doing for the MAC addresses, it takes the first six characters and it has a table saying, oh, those were assigned to Apple. It must be an Apple device. That's what makes it a little easier to see. There's its IP address and there's its IP address. Let's next take a look at the access point, which happens to be a D-Link that I, I had laying around. So I just plugged it in for this demonstration. So there's a D-Link address reference. Another one, another one, another one. And finally in blue, let's go ahead and put the alpha card. Now the alpha is the manufacturer of the actual card, the network adapter, so that's why I'm calling it alpha. It's actually a Linux box that's running. So for the alpha, we have the address of 198, as well as the layer two address alpha here. And there's 198 and 198 as well. So one question might come up says, well, Keith, why isn't it showing anything here and here and here? There's no source address. What Wireshark typically does, it shows us the highest level address. So for example, if there's no layer three address, it shows a layer two address. If there's no layer two address, it ends up blank like this. So with a clear to send message, as well as like some acknowledgements here, you'll notice that those are very, very small. They wanna have very little overhead. So they don't really even need a source address. So as the Apple got this clear to send back, because the request to send went to the D-Link, it's implied that the clear to send is coming back from that same D-Link. So we're saving a little bit of space in the frame by not including a source address. And that's why there is no source address in packets two, six, or eight. Also, there's one blue mark there, that's the alpha card address as well. And there's no source address here in this acknowledgement as well either. So now all of our packets are accounted for and all the addresses are accounted for as well. It is really important to understand in this scenario, how the actual frames are being sent back and forth between the access point and the addresses involved. The reason why is, is because once we add a wireless LAN controller, we're gonna take this fundamental knowledge of how it works 
and kick it up a couple more notches. So we're going to be building on what we learn in this video. We have an RTS request to send and that was sourced by the Apple device. So we have a request to send and that was sent. Now that's really intended to go to the D-Link. In frame two, we have a clear to send that was sourced by the D-Link for the benefit of the Apple device. The main purpose of the request to send and clear to send is that duration field. What's happening is the Apple device is reserving bandwidth, a little space and time, so that he can go ahead and do his ping. Now let's go to number three. Now with packet number three, we're doing a ping request. And the destination of that request is going to the IP address of the alpha. So even though it's intended for the alpha, because in infrastructure mode, it's not ad hoc. We don't have direct wireless communications and conversations. Everything is going through the distribution system. In this case, it's the access point. In number four, we have an acknowledgement. So we have an acknowledgement saying, yep, I got the frame, which is intended to go back to the Apple device. And five sometimes throws people for a loop. They look and they say, wow, this is an echo ping request again. However, it's just the D-Link and directing it to the address of the alpha. So when this alpha device gets it, the source IP address will be Apple. The destination will be the alpha at layer three. But if we take a look at the details of who actually transmitted this frame, I was going to show it was transmitted by the D-Link. In six, we have an acknowledgement that was sourced by this alpha. Going back to the D-Link. Now right here, it's not showing the source address. And that's simply because we're saving overhead. When the D-Link gets that acknowledgement, he'll know who it came from. And it will be a confirmation to the D-Link that the frame it just sent arrived successfully. And now we have our reply, which is our ICMP echo reply, the reply to the ping request. We send that over to the D-Link because that's our access point in infrastructure mode. In packet number eight, we send an acknowledgement from the D-Link saying, yep, I got your frame. Thank you very much. In packet nine, we continue the reply. This is the access point forwarding that reply to the address of the Apple. And then in packet 10, we have the acknowledgement back to the D-Link that says, yep, I got that frame. Thank you very much. Now, what I think is really important for you to do is this. I would like you to take this capture file, which I've included in the Nugget Lab files for this video, and this little graphic, which has space for the 10 frames involved. And I'd like you to actually take this packet capture and walk through it. Now, if you want to step through the video one more time, that's great too, but actually doing it frame by frame and writing them out, who sourced it, who was it for, what type of packet was it, was it a control frame, was it a data frame, that will be very helpful as you begin to master the details that take place in the wireless local area networks that we use and love today. I'd also like to chat with you about one detail called the hidden node. For example, let's say the Apple is at the far edge of the basic service area and the Alpha device is at the other far edge of the basic service area. It's quite possible that this Apple device, let's go ahead and draw in green their range of their radio receivers. It's possible that these two stations may never see each other's signals. However, the D-Link, which is operating as the access point, can see both of them. So one of the benefits of using the request to send and clear to send is that even though the D-Link is saying this clear to send, it doesn't just go from a radio frequency perspective in one direction to the Apple. It actually goes, if it's an omnidirectional antenna, all directions. So when the D-Link sends this clear to send, number two right here, there's going to be a duration, that network allocation vector with that we're reserving. So even though the alpha may not be aware of this conversation that's happening between the Apple and the D-Link, he does see this clear to send, which lets him know that the D-Link is reserving some airspace, which will help this alpha device and any others that are on this side of the network inside of that cell not think that the airwaves are clear. So RTS, CTS can potentially assist us with the problem of the hidden node because the access point has access to all devices in the cell. And the next question I'd like to address is the data direction. So for the actual ping, request and replies, were they going to or from the distribution system, which in this case is the access point? Here's why this is important. Sometimes when we're looking at traffic and we're trying to decipher what the heck is this? What's it part of? Looking at the flags for is this going to a distribution system to the AP or is it coming from the AP? That can help out a great deal. To do that, we're going to take a look at data packets. This packets three, five, seven, and nine are the ping requests and the ping replies 
And if we open up one of those, for example, let's open up frame number three and open up the details of that. And let's open up the frame control field and the flags. Specifically, these two bits right here are gonna tell the story is this a data frame that was going to the access point or being sent from the access point? We only have two bits to play with. And the decoder ring for this is the first bit, is it from the DS, meaning is it being sent from the distribution system? That's the first bit. And the second bit indicates it's going to the distribution system. And in our example, the access point is the distribution system. So the combinations we have here would be zero, zero, which means it's not going to or from a distribution system. You might see that, for example, on non-data packets, or for example, an ad hoc network where there is no infrastructure mode, it wouldn't be going to or from a distribution system. If we look at zero, one, that would mean, okay, this is going to a distribution system, as is the case right here. Is our Apple device sending a data frame to the distribution system, to the access point? And that's why that's a zero one. Now the Wireshark is actually spelling that out for us as well, which is handy. The next option would be one zero. And that would be a frame being sent from a distribution system. For example, the AP out to a station. For example, if we open up frame number five, which we will here in just a moment, we would see that this frame of data, which is carrying the actual ping request is being sent from the access point to a station. So we would see in frame five that this would be a one zero for these two bits. And the last option here is a one one which means it's from a distribution system going to a distribution system. When is that ever gonna happen? Well, if you ever have repeaters and other wireless devices in a mesh network, for example, forwarding data between access points, that's exactly when that would happen. So for example, let's go over to frame number five. So the DS status is one zero, indicating it's from the distribution system from the access point, making its way out to a wireless station. So a one zero in binary, is two in both decimal, and as shown here, it also happens to be a two in hexadecimal. What I think we also should do is take a look at all the addresses involved. For example, in frame number three, let's go ahead and collapse these flags for a moment, and let's focus on these addresses. So just to make sure we're on the same frame, we're looking at frame number three. So the source and destination address is pretty straightforward. This is the source address of the Apple, the layer two address, and the destination address of the alpha. The Apple card is using its own transmitter to source this frame. This is going to the access point. So the receiver who's gonna be picking up that frame is our D-Link. And we're currently associated in infrastructure mode with this access point. One thing you should definitely be aware of with RTS and CTS, although it is a fantastic way for a device to reserve itself a little slice of bandwidth on the media, it doesn't have to be used. There's something called an RTS CTS threshold. And if a device is gonna send a small packet that doesn't exceed the threshold, it can go ahead and do its countdown, look to see if the media is clear, and simply send. I mean, why bother doing the request to send and clear to send if there's nobody in your space anyway? You just go for it. So what you might find if you start using protocol analyzers on your networks is that you might see devices sending traffic without any RTS, CTS, because they haven't hit the threshold. For example, if the threshold is 2000 bytes, Anything smaller than that doesn't require RTS CTS. It's very likely you're not gonna be seeing RTS CTS traffic when sending small frames of data. Another thing I've experienced is I've seen devices send an RTS and not wait for any type of a CTS. Effectively, they're just saying, you know what, here's a request to send, which does reserve some bandwidth because they have the duration field. And then they go ahead and immediately start sending some frames. There's also another option called CTS self, where you send a clear to send to yourself which you think, how's that gonna help? Well, if you send a clear to send and everybody else is paying attention to that, they look at the duration field. If they were about to send, that's gonna have them back off a little bit further because they have that additional countdown. So the options with RTS CTS is, it doesn't have to be used. You may see RTS by itself. You may see CTS by itself, or you may see RTS CTS used in combination. In the packet capture included in the Nugget Lab files for this video for the capture, I specifically modified the RTS threshold so that I could get at least one RTS CTS as the first two frames in the capture. And now that you know that RTS CTS may or may not show up, you'll have fewer surprises as you start capturing and looking at your own wireless network traffic. As a result of this video, you now have a better ability to describe the behavior and the function as two devices in the same cell communicate with each other with a standalone access point.
I've had a great time. I appreciate you joining me. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.